All right, everybody. We gave you an extra five minutes. Obviously, it wasn't enough. No, no. Oh, my goodness. What a great day. What a great day. And what a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? All right. Well, we are going to try to get everybody rounded back up, back to their seats. You can take your snack with you, your coffee with you. Try not to sit it on the floor. We really don't like cleaning that up. Unless it's empty, then go ahead. So good to see people here this morning that I haven't got to see for a little while. Especially enjoy seeing Steve Martin. Steve, you're still talking. I'm talking about you back there, bud. I could have said I'm so glad to hear Steve Martin, and that would have been true too. Uh, now, Steve's been an awesome part of my family's uh, experiencing Alaska and getting brought in here into this into into this family of believers. Uh, Steve is is our Irish friend who uh, we actually, if you watch the the pictures out there, I think they're still on there on the slideshow out in the foyer. Um, uh, but there's a picture of him all dressed up as a leprechaun at uh, the St. Paddy's Day parade, and and uh, yeah, we standing right with us and. And people would just come up to us and ask to get pictures taken with Steve. They're like, he's like a celebrity, you know. And I get to tell people, other pastors down south, I'm like, yeah, I, Steve Martin goes to our church. I don't tell them which Steve Martin, I just, you know. I mean, they're like, wow, I didn't know he had a house in Alaska. I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of celebrities up here, you know, a lot of celebrities come to the Kenai, you know. Um, I mean, he's a celebrity here. I'm not lying to him. He is Steve Martin, and he's a local celebrity, so there you go. But no, Steve, it is so good to have you back with us, and, and something that Steve and I and others um, have been praying for for a long time is just for him to be able to have the strength to be able to serve God the way he wants to. Like He, his, he feels that one of his callings is to bring joy to people, like, like, and if you've you know, spent much time with him, I mean, you're going to end up laughing. You know, you're going to end up laughing, but he's just been so weak and so tired, and it's just awesome to see God answering his prayer. And uh, um, just the other day, even, it was just a, a, just a cool thing that um, he was really struggling after the surgery because there seemed to be a side effect, and, and he was worried that he was going to have to go back in, and maybe that there was going to be a problem, and he called several others. I know Steve Croft was in on that, and Joy and Hayward, and, and we prayed with, with Steve, and, and, and he was literally just about to, to, to go in. He was calling the, the surgeon's office for, that put in the pacemaker to say, I, there's something wrong. I need to come back in, and as he's like getting on the phone, just all went away, just like that. It just went away like that, and it was just awesome. And so we know that God walks with us through our journey. Sometimes we get that like miracle that changes everything, and we don't need to go see the doctor. We don't need, and that happens. It still happens today, you know. And but often, often what He does is He gives us the the passion and the grace and the strength to walk through this journey. And He brings people alongside us, and He brings us alongside people. And it's just so cool that we have that privilege of doing that today. And so uh, I did want to uh, just make a quick mention about the, the gifts. If you have recently joined us and, and started attending here, um, you don't get like, 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 you don't have to miss out on the gifts. We're not, we're not excluding you. Um, so you can grab one too. So like, I, I'm going to leave it up to your, you know, I mean, some of you are like, I recently joined four years ago. Um, I don't know. That might be stretching it. <laughs> That might be stretching it, okay? It kind of depends on what recent means to you, but no one's going to be judging you back there, so if you want a coffee cup, you know. Um, but uh, th there's more, it's more than just a coffee cup. There's, there's a little bit about our church in there, and then there's also uh, a little thing that, that helps us connect with you. Uh, it's it's a, just a little questionnaire. We'd love for you to get it to, um, filled out and turned in so that we have an ability to, to get in touch with you, to know where you're coming from. Some people are just here, one-time visit. You're from out of town. That's okay. There's a spot on there that just says, hey, I'm just visiting. I'm from out of town or whatever. But there's also just uh, an opportunity for you to, to give us that chance to reach out and connect with you. We would love to connect with you. This is, if you didn't figure it out at break time, we are a very family church. Like, this church is family. If, if, you, if you come here for very long, you're just going to get adopted. We have, God has given this church the spirit of adoption, which is something that God carries. God has the spirit of adoption. That's why we're here. That's why he sent his son to live 
and to die and to rise again so that we could be adopted. And that's what I love about this church is that there's a spirit of adoption here. So if you have been recently adopted or just visiting either way, um, uh, go ahead and grab one of these. There's a bunch of them. There's like 20 of them. You can even come up and get this one if you want. Um, also, one more thing um, about giveaways is if you are a young person, and I'm going to, again, leave definition a little bit up to, but these were intended um, for children and young teens, so probably like 12, 13, and under. Um, we made uh, some little snack bags, and uh, there's all kinds of good stuff in there, but there's an explanation of every component in there and what it has to do um, with the, the, the Easter story and the gospel. And so it's really kind of cool. Um, there's pretzel sticks for the cross and an Oreo for the stone that was rolled away and, you know, just all kinds of... I'm not going to start eating it. Okay, I'm going to put that down. <laughs> all right. So uh, I want to say really quick um, just a hello to those who are joining us online and, uh, and, just, and just thank you for joining us online. I'm sure there's a few extras that are joining us because of the windstorm, and we understand that, that you would rather be here in person, and the truth is we would rather have you in person here too. Dina, Scott, I'm talking to you. Um, we would love to have you here, but we understand. We understand that this is uh, an area that's often, it's hard to get out. It's hard to always make it. And so we appreciate the ability to have an online service, and we love to welcome people joining us online. We also want to say thank you to our media team who makes that possible. So let's give them a hand really quick back there. I learned a long time ago to be nice to the media team because they can make me sound terrible if they want to. Um, my big brother used to be the, the media um, department head at the church that, where I was serving before, and so it was always rough to have your big brother in the sound booth back there because, you know, he, he, he could distort your voice or do whatever he wanted to um, if you were not nice to him, so I always... Uh, kept that in mind. Um, but uh, no, but we also just really appreciate um, being able to reach people online. There's different reasons why um, you might be joining us online this morning. Um, and, uh, and, and we really um, know that that's sometimes the way you connect, the way we connect. Um, I mean, seriously, how many people in the room here this morning have watched service online before? How many people have you watched this service, our service online before? A lot of you, a lot of us. Um, and, and, and it's just a great thing. And so if you're tuning in online right now and you're part of this church, you're still part right here. Even though you're not with us, you're part of us. If you're tuning in from a local point um, and you have never come and, and seen us in person and, and, and visited, we would encourage you, we would encourage you, if you can in any way, make the trek, come on out and visit with us. We're better in person, we're better live um, than uh, live stream. Uh, but if you're watching from far away, this is something I say over and over and over, is don't just watch services on TV. Like, find a local body of believers and connect. It is so important. God means for us to connect personally. The ability to connect online is great. Like, it's a huge blessing. It's a technology that just blows my mind um, how it can even happen. But the reality is, is he meant for us to connect in person. So we just want to encourage you, if you're watching online from a faraway place that you can't connect with us, find a body of believers and connect. All right, one last kind of note before we get going here. Um, I just want to, uh, I just want to encourage, um, I just feel like God, last night when I was going over my notes, I just feel like God gave me an encouragement, and maybe this is for someone in the room, maybe this is for someone who's watching online, um, but God just put something in my heart last night when I was just going back over my notes. And I just want to encourage you this morning that God sees you. Um, sometimes uh, that can, has been construed in our lives as a negative thing, like God's watching you. I remember my parents telling me that. Just remember, whatever you do tonight, God's right there with you. And I'm like, oh, thanks, mom and dad. <laughs> like, there's that old saying, you know, leave room for Jesus, you know. Um, but, but, the reality is, is there's another side to that. Like sometimes we get hung up on that part that God sees everything. But seriously, this morning you need to hear, and there's a couple people that probably need to hear this. Like God sees you. He sees what you're going through. He sees your hurts. He sees the things that you're carrying. 
He knows that, that you feel alone and you're not alone. And I just want to encourage you this morning that you're not alone. The, the beauty of the gospel, the beauty of, of what we were talking about just a moment ago is that, is that Jesus made a way so that you could be called a child of God and you are not alone. And so I just want to encourage you this morning, if that's you and you're feeling lately, you've just been feeling alone, you've been feeling invisible, you've been struggling, just know that you are not alone and know that there not only is the Lord for, for you, but there are people right here that are for you. And, uh, and if you want to reach out to us online and just say, hey, I've been struggling, we will come alongside you and pray with you. If you're here this morning in person and that's you, before you leave today, just connect with someone and just say, hey, that, that message about feeling alone, about feeling invisible was for me. And would you pray with me? Would you encourage me? There are people who will come alongside you. And that's something that is so beautiful is when the body of Christ gets to serve literally as his hands and feet. So don't, don't overlook that opportunity this morning. Amen? All right. So this is the final week of our series, He Is. And uh, we have been in a six-week series, if you haven't been with us, um, called He Is, where we've been exploring the, the nature and the person of Jesus Christ. And so I'm so excited with this wrap-up and uh, so excited to, to um, reach this special, special occasion where we're, we're going to um, bring this whole, this whole concept. We've been talking about who Jesus is through his life on earth, through his coming. If you haven't been with us through the series, you can check it out on our YouTube page. All the, the sermons are on there and even in separate video form, so you can share them or whatever you want to do. But this morning, we're bringing it all together and we're culminating around a big surprise topic, okay? Like, I'm sure you didn't see this one coming. He is alive. Okay, I know it wasn't a big surprise, right? But, but seriously, it is one of the most important parts of the He Is series. Without this part, like, again, there's a lot of things about the nature and the character of the person of Jesus Christ that we have gotten excited about over the last six weeks. But this one, this one right here is, is essential. It's, it's essential for our faith. Because if he wasn't alive, we would just be talking about someone who's not here with us. We'd be talking about someone who did something great, and all that leaves us is expectations. But because Jesus rose from the dead, because he is alive, because he lives forevermore, we have hope. We have hope. All of the things that we learn about him matter because he is alive and he is still active and doing those things in the world today. He has not quit, he has not changed, and he is not dead, he is alive. And so while we, we, we marvel at, at the, the agony and, and, and the beauty of the cross, the story for us as believers is not only that there was an old rugged cross, but that there is an empty tomb. And so this morning, as we look at this idea of what it means that Jesus is alive, I just want us to, to, to breathe that in, to remind ourselves that so often it's hard because everything in us tries to categorize our faith as something that's separate from our reality, but it is not. Because the one whom we believe in is alive and well and with us today. We're not talking about our forefathers. We're not talking about our grandfathers. We're not talking about something that only happened 2,000 years ago. We're talking about a living Savior who is alive today. And that is so, so important. Because without that, we really don't have anything different than any other philosophy or any other religion. But because we have a living Savior, we have hope, we have joy. We have power. We have access. We have access through our living Savior to the promises of God. And that is awesome. Um, next, next week, I'm just going to give you a little sneak peek here. We're starting that new series. And next, next week, we're starting a series on prayer. And it's going to be called Lifeline. It's going to be called Lifeline. And it's going to jump right off from where we're at because it's, we're going to be dealing with the idea that we're connected to this living Savior. That this isn't, because that's the other thing is like some people are like Jesus is alive, but he's like way out there. 
Like, he, how does he connect with me? Young people, I think that that's a reality that we grapple with. Like, we grapple with that reality that, that like, Jesus is actually here because everything in us is like, I can see and touch and feel these things. I can see that person right over there. I can talk to my mom and dad. I can do all these things, but I can't see Jesus, so how do I know he's alive? And we have to get past that point and to the point where we are beginning to connect with him, and we're going to start digging into that next week with talking about the lifeline, the connection between us and our living Savior. But today we're going to talk about the fact that he is alive, and we're going to read a scripture to start us out this morning. It's on the front of your bulletin. I got one, Jason. <laughs> just saying, just saying. I mean, but anyways, it's on the front of your bulletin. It's also found in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. This is what it says. It says, during the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time. And he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. I'm just going to pray and ask the Lord to bless our time in the word this morning. Father, this morning I thank you and I praise you. And I thank you that you sent your son to die on my behalf. It wasn't just for others or for bad people. God, it was for me. God, because all of us, myself included, needed that Savior. But God, I'm, I'm even thankful to an, a, another level that he didn't just die on my behalf, but he rose again. And this morning, I pray that you would spark in our hearts, God, a work of your Spirit restoring, stirring, awakening our hearts to realize that Jesus is alive, that he is indeed alive and well today, and that he desires to bring us together with you and interact in our lives, just as he did with the apostles and the disciples. So God, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, I love that passage. It's, it's from the, the beginning of the book of Acts, and I love reading it, and I love thinking about that, because we don't have a record of all the different ways that he appeared and showed them. It's kind of fun. I mean, there's a, some cool stories. Uh, if, I would encourage you. Like, there's a lot of things we do at Easter time. Some of them kind of make sense. Some of them make no sense. You know, like why we would do this for an Easter celebration as Christians. I'm not dogging on. I'm not going to get into, oh, that's pagan roots or whatever. All I'm going to do is encourage you, take some time this Easter season and read the stories. Like read the stories, read the gospels, read what, read the road to Emmaus, like read about these things because this is not just a, you know, Jesus died, rose again, then he just disappeared and we don't know nothing. Like that sometimes the way we go about it, it's like we, we condense it down to the point. It's like, you know, like we're, we, we live in like a John 316 gospel generation where it's like, that's all we know for God to love the world. Yes, he loves the world, but there's like, he told us more than that. He told us more than just that he loves us. Like there's some cool stuff about when Jesus rose again. I've been reading the stories throughout this week, and I was reading, you know, about when the, when the guys all decided to go fishing. That's a good one, huh? Come on. It's like, what are we going to do? Let's go fishing, right? Pete, and it's Peter. Peter goes, I'm going fishing. Everybody goes with him. You got to be careful. Like God has given some of you like a great spirit of influence. There's people in this room, you know who you are, because if I asked you to raise your hand, everybody else would raise their hand with you because you have been given an influence. Peter had an influence and what did he use it to do? He went fishing, right? But when Jesus showed up on the shore, he was also the first one to dive out of the boat. I love that. He didn't wait. He didn't stick around even with the fish. They had this massive haul of fish going on. And Jesus calls to him and he just dives out of the boat and swims to shore. It says about 100 meters. That's a good swim, right? Like there's some cool stories. And this scripture just lets us know that there was more than that. There's more times that Jesus appeared. Jesus did some amazing things. We talk about some of them. You know, poor Thomas, he goes down as the guy, you know, we nicknamed him Doubting Thomas from this one story, right? Right? Read it, read it. It's actually a great story, okay? But here's the reality. Jesus was making a point. You see, you see, sometimes like 
Don't get me wrong, like I'm super excited about the empty tomb. I think we have a graphic with the empty tomb in the backdrop right there. It's like, yeah, the empty tomb's a huge testimony. But Jesus didn't just like sneak out of the tomb and sneak off to heaven and go, I hope you guys figure it out. (laughs) Bye. Kind of surprised. I mean, if by the time he was done living on this earth and then being crucified on a cross, I think he probably would have been ready in a natural sense to be like, oh, I am so ready for a break, right? (laughs) But the Bible says he stuck around. He stuck around and he made many opportunities to show them proofs that he was alive. That's powerful because he was intentional. He was intentional. He didn't just get happened to be seen. He didn't just, someone didn't just bump into him. And and I think the reason why this is so important to me this morning is because Jesus is doing something as the living Savior is he's being intentional about keeping the process of what he came to do going. He's, he's, he, the Bible says that Jesus came to restore us to the Father, right? And the Bible says, and we're going to read the scripture, that we have the ministry, ministry of reconciliation. Like we have the ministry of reconciliation given to us, and Jesus is intentional, intentional blah, blah, about getting that going in the early church. He didn't just go, okay, well, I taught you guys a bunch of stuff, and now I'm going to be resurrected, and then I'm going to disappear. He instead, he, he says, I want to be intentional about showing you that I'm still the same. Let's get into some scripture this morning that talks about this. It's so cool what God tells us in the word. There's a, we're going to be reading in John chapter 20, verses 19 and 20 to start out. And it's just so cool what Jesus did here. I'm going to read this one from the NIV. I, I like to read a lot of different versions. I'm sorry if that messes with you. Um, there's probably six versions on the floor here this morning um, between everybody. Um, but this is from the NIV. Um, it says, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now, I just want to take a moment and think about what Jesus is doing here and what's happening here. Because the empty tomb had already been discovered, right? Like this is the evening. This is Sunday night. This is Sunday night, like er, very early in the morning as the sun was beginning to rise, they discovered the empty tomb, right? But by nightfall, they're already locked up behind closed doors. Like, do you see that even amongst the disciples, there was this uncertainty about what it really meant that he rose from the dead. They didn't know what to do with this fact. They didn't know what to do. They had been told we have an angelic witness, but they didn't know what to do with it. And by the way, they weren't the only ones who had witnessed the empty tomb. You see, as you you look at this overall situation, one of the things that you're going to recognize is that the empty tomb was a reality that the whole community was grappling with. The whole community is grappling with this reality that there's a tomb that's now empty. You can't tell me that this just was a silent little fact that went just slipped past you know, everyone because there was a lot going on. This was the most prominent character at the time, this Jesus of Nazareth who was just crucified at the demands of an angry crowd and then laid in a borrowed tomb which was sealed with a Roman seal, like it was against the law to break the seal. This was like a big deal, a huge deal to them. And they sealed that tomb and they put an armed guard around it. I mean, this was not a small thing. And yet what we see is people don't know what to do with it. Even the disciples, some of them who would become the apostles of the early church, did not know what to do with this fact. 
And the reality is, is our world today doesn't either. Should we, should we gather on, on, on a couple times a year? Should we try to be better people? Should we wear a cross? Should we put a bumper sticker on that says, my car won't go faster than my guardian angels fly or something? I don't know. What, is, what do we do with this fact that, that Jesus is alive? What do you do with it? It's, it's a real situation. And we see people grappling with it. Because there was all kinds of people that knew. There was rich and there was poor. There were soldiers and there was Pharisees. There was Romans, there was Jews. There were servants and there were kings. And they were all aware that this tomb was empty. But what do you do with it? What do you do with this truth that there's an empty tomb? And what does that mean for us today? And Jesus right here so beautifully deliberately gives us answers because he goes to his disciples. You see, we sang that song this morning that, that the goodness of God and that the goodness of God is running after us. You see, Jesus didn't stand back from afar. He didn't go to the garden of, Beth, uh, of Gethsemane again. He didn't go to or Gethsemane again and didn't, didn't uh, just stand there and wait for them and see if they're going to show up. He didn't stand with his arms crossed looking down um, from, from Golgotha on the city who had crucified him. He didn't, he didn't make himself separate, but instead he went to the ones who he was bringing together with him that he was bringing them in. He was bringing them together with him. The Bible is very clear that that is the heart of our God and that is the heart of our Savior, is that he is to unite us with the Father. Like He says that I want you and I to be one just like the Father and I are one. And so Jesus goes after them. They're hidden away. They're, locked. They're in locked doors. Can you imagine being in that room? They're like, you know, blinds shut, doors locked, be quiet. <laughs> they don't want to be the next one on the cross. Like, here's the reality is they're thinking like, this could get a little, little wild because th maybe they were worried that, that there was rumors. Remember, there was rumors that his, his followers had come and stolen the body. That was one of the ways that, that the Romans and the Jews dealt with it is they started rumors. They started rumors that, that, that the body had been stolen. I was reading this, this week uh, um, just a, a commentary um, about the resurrection, and I was thinking about the fact that, that to a certain degree, now we don't know how much they saw before having a reaction to the supernatural, but the soldiers that guarded the tomb were like eyewitnesses of the resurrection. And yet we have no record of any of them believing. Can I just put forward to you guys this morning that, that seeing isn't always believing? Like believing is, 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 an, is, is an action of faith. Like you can see it and not believe it. You can hear it and not receive it. And so we have, we have these different struggles that were happening and even the disciples are struggling and they're behind closed doors they're afraid. And what does Jesus do? He shows up in their midst and he just shows up. He just, he's just like, you know, he doesn't knock. The, 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 the original text is very clear that it says Jesus appeared in their midst. Like he just appears. Like you're all like, we're all like hunkered down, a little nervous, got all the, the lamps off. We're kind of just hoping people think that we've all scattered and ran to another place. And then Jesus is standing there. And what is the first thing he says? Look at this. I love this. The first thing he says is peace be with you. We're going to go over the, the things that Jesus is bringing to his disciples this night. And we're going to go over the things that he's bringing to our world today. Okay? Because there are, there are as the, the risen Savior, he has a, a series of of things that he is trying to bring us into, that he's trying to connect us to that come from God. They're like gifts from the Father, and the risen Savior is trying to make sure we get them. 
He doesn't want us to do this without these gifts. And the first gift is peace. The first gift is peace. He's peace be with you. He doesn't scold them. He doesn't doesn't, uh, start commissioning them or challenging them. The first thing he says is peace be with you. Like how wonderful is the peace of God. The Bible describes the peace of God as the peace that passes understanding. The Bible tells us that, that he is the prince of peace. He's the prince of peace. He's the the one whose authority is to bring peace. And you might say, well, well, following Jesus hasn't brought peace in my situation. The peace he's offering us is peace within. In fact, if if you read what Jesus taught, he said, you know, often when you choose to follow me, it's going to bring trouble. It's going to bring trouble. You're not looking necessarily for peace as the world sees it. That's why, that's why we refer to it as peace that passes understanding because it's not the same kind of peace that makes sense to someone else. Otherwise, it would have been like, okay, guys, I made you all invisible. You can sneak out of town. Right? Like that would have made a lot of sense, logically. But no, he says, I'm going to give you peace right here, right here under the shadow of Rome, under the shadow of angry Jewish leaders who are trying to make excuses for the missing body. I'm going to give you peace. It's a gift. It doesn't have to make sense to the world. It doesn't have to make sense to our logic. And he's offering that today. I love the passage where he says, Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Like this was, we, I know that Jesus went through the worst that anyone could ever go through that night, but can you just think about his followers for a minute? Like, like this, is, this was just, just rough. I was reading a commentary about just thinking about what Mary, his mom, went through. Like they had just endured like some, some sights and some days that were just challenging to the nth degree because they had put all their trust in this Jesus. They, they were believing that he was going to deliver them and then they watch as he dies on a cross. They have just, they're, they're traumatized. They're struggling. And he comes to them and gives them peace. The next thing that he's offering, the next thing that he's trying to bring us together with is belief. Isn't it cool that after he says, peace be with you, that he shows them that he's real. Like he shows them that he's real. Like he's like, look at my, my, my hands and my side. Like I'm real. I'm not, I'm, this isn't just a, 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 a good thought. This isn't just something that, that to, to console you a little bit. Like I am real. And if you're here this morning, I believe that Jesus still wants to show you that he's real. It may not look the same as it did that day, I know a few people who have seen Jesus, okay? And I believe them. You can tell me I'm crazy, that's fine, but Jesus is alive, so I'm not crazy because he can do and show himself to whoever he wants to. But I'm not going to promise each one of you that you're going to have an epiphany, that you're going to meet Jesus face to face. I can't do that. That's not within my authority. That's not something I can offer you. But I can offer you that Jesus will make himself real to you if you ask him to. If you receive that peace, if you say, yes, Lord, I'm just going to step one more step forward and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to receive this, he's going to give you the gift of faith. Because remember, there's, faith is a gift. Like We all have a measure of faith, and, and it gets complicated when you read about it because you might just think, like, well, maybe I just don't have enough faith. And, and, and the really, the truth is, none of us quite have enough. But what he asks of us is, is he says, will you just put the part that you have in, and then I'll fill in the rest? I'll fill in the rest. Like He'll fill in the rest. He knew that his disciples needed to see his hands and feet. And there's a lot to that. I don't have time to teach on all that. But, but basically, he, they needed to see that he was the same Jesus who just hung on the cross, not just a, 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 
a spirit or an, an, they had beliefs at that time about, about every person having like a, a, an angel lookalike. There was all kinds of stuff that could have clouded their understanding of what was really happening. But he goes, I want to reveal myself to you in a way that will mean something to you. And I, and I give you this this morning that Jesus will do the same for you. He will. If you say, that's never happened, Pastor John, I've never heard God's voice. Uh, the scriptures have never made sense to me. I've been going to church since I was a kid, and like none of this has ever made sense. I just keep doing it because I guess I just figure, it's, it's, what, why not? Can I just challenge you this morning, like take a step forward in your heart, like say, I'm going to receive the peace that you have for me, and I'm going to, and I'm going to put what faith I have forward, and I'm going to trust you to fill it in, and he will meet you there. He will meet you there. If you don't believe it, think about what he did for Thomas. That's actually later on down in the same chapter. It's like there was Thomas wasn't there, and he was like, I got a special, I got a special meeting for Thomas. That comes up. Let's read a couple more verses. Um, just 21 through 23, it's same, same chapter, John chapter 20. It says this. It says, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So we have the first time he says, peace be with you. And he's like, he's just comforting them. He's saying, I'm here for you. I'm giving you the gift of peace. Then he, he says to them, let me show you that I'm real. And it filled them with joy. And then he returns back to a second time of saying, peace be with you. And I was, I was thinking and praying over that. And I'm like, he says it twice. After they're filled with joy. Like, didn't they have like peace after they got filled with joy? And, and what really strikes me in this second time peace be with you, is that he's saying, I'm giving you something abiding. I'm giving you belonging. This isn't just a momentary calming so that you can feel better in your current situation, which so often happens in our religious experiences. Like we get in a bad spot. We have a health need. We have a family need. We cry out to God. We receive some peace. And then we just kind of wander off and do our own thing. Christ is not just giving us peace for that moment. He's offering us belonging, like belonging. And he offers that in this next statement of peace, but also in what comes right after it. Because he's saying, peace be with you. And then he instantly starts talking about his relationship with the Father and the relationship that he's giving us. So he's saying, I have lasting peace for you in belonging. This isn't just something we run to when we're hurting. We don't just run to the Lord when we're hurting. We're just like, oh, I'm a mess. I need you. Which, by the way, it's fine. Like, it's fine to go to God like that. Like, I don't want to act like it's not. But he's offering us something much greater. He's offering us belonging. He's offering us a place in his kingdom He's offering us a relationship of peace. And again, I'm not going to tell you that your walk as a Christian is all going to be, you know, sunshine and butterflies. It's going to have 50 mile an hour winds and power outages. <laughs> Threw that one in. It was free. Right? It doesn't, it's not like he's saying, and you know, and after this, everything will be great. Once you believe in me, everything's going to be just lovely. No, he's saying, I will continue to give you peace in your belonging, in your place in the kingdom. The next thing that he brings is power. It's power. I love the fact that it says that he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Because this, those are the same words. Like when, we, when you unpack like the, the Genesis, when it says that God breathed 
life into Adam. And if you look at the, the, the exact same words that were translated when they translated the Hebrew text, they chose the exact same words as in this in the original text that it says that he breathed on them the same way that God breathed on Adam and gave him physical life. Jesus is breathing upon us, breathing upon the church and saying, I'm giving you life. I'm giving you the power of life. The Holy Spirit is not just for the goosebumps. Someone posted on the other day, the, on Facebook the other day, it says the Holy Spirit is, is just as much for um, having us uh, what did it say? Something about um, shutting your mouth and 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 uh, and honoring God as much as it's for jumping up and dancing. And I thought, <laughs> I thought that's pretty funny, but it's true because the Holy Spirit is a misunderstood idea. He is not sent just to give us goosebumps and help us have a wonderful time at church. He's not sent just so that we can have special gifts and special things, which he does do both of those things. But he, he is sent so that we can have the, the power and the life of God dwelling within us. The Bible says that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. And it's because of this scripture right here. Because Jesus said himself, it's better for you that I go. Because when I go, the helper's going to come. And we don't understand that often. Often we just think, if I could get a little more of that power, if I could get a little more of that, of that stuff, whatever it is, that, 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 that Holy Ghost stuff, I want some of that. Sometimes it's a little scary. If you've been around some weird examples, you could be like, well, I'm not sure if I want any of that. That's kind of weird stuff. I've seen it. I understand what you're saying, okay? Um, but in all reality, if we took, if we just got took the weirdness out of the equation and just said, would you like more power in your life today? Would you like to have life-giving power? Would you like to have the power that Jesus described as rivers of life flowing out of you? Like rivers of life-giving power flowing out of your life. Would you like that? Is this what you want? That's what Jesus is offering. He's offering that. He's saying, I have it for you. But it's connected to one last thing purpose. You see, he didn't just give us power so that we could just be like a bunch of kids with big squirt guns running around squirting everybody. I don't know why that analogy just came to my mind, but I was thinking about if you give like a 12-year-old like a super soaker, it doesn't matter who else has one. As many people as they can are going to get wet, right? Even if they don't want to. <laughs> It's going, to get, it's, going to get, it's going to get wild. And sometimes we've presented the Holy Ghost like that. We've presented the power of God like that. And, and, and don't get me wrong, like, I think the, that God has this great sense of humor. But he's not just equipping us so that we can do whatever we want. Like that water of life isn't just to go spray people in the face with. It's supposed to bring life to the thirsty, hope to the hopeless. And it's supposed to reconcile people to God. That last verse, verse 23, it's kind of weird. Like, I don't know if you, if you like, you know, thinking and dwelling on, on like what a verse might mean, but it literally says, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. There's some churches that have derived that like the, the apostolic authority to forgive sins, like, like was retained through singular individuals who passed it on. That's not a good interpretation of this scripture, okay? But what is the right interpretation? What is our purpose? Well, what did Christ come for? He came to reconcile us to God. He came to bring a people to God who were not his people, who had been divided from him by sin, and he said, I'm going to reconcile them to myself. And, and so this is, his, this is the purpose of, of the life of Christ, the purpose he rose from the dead. He didn't just, just rise from the dead to prove it. He rose from the dead so that we could fully be reconciled to the Father. And what he's doing here is he's, is he's including us, not giving away 
the, the ministry of forgiveness, but including us. You guys stop and think about this for just a moment. If you have received Christ, if you're listening this morning, if you're online, if you're here in person and you have received Christ, you have been included in the ministry of reconciliation. Like that's what we're here for. We're here to continue the work that Jesus lived, died, and rose again for, to reconcile people to himself and to his father. Like, that's what we exist for, like right now here on this earth. Like, we're here on this earth. If you're drawing breath this morning, we are included as believers in the ministry of reconciliation. There's actually a passage, I'll just read it really quick, but it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and it says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and as he has, co- and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That's what he was doing right there in, in John chapter 20, is he was saying, okay, I'm giving you peace. I'm giving you belief, faith. I'm giving you something to believe in. It's real. It's not a joke. It's not, it's not, it's not a mystery. It's real. I'm real. I'm real. I'm going to give you belonging. You are now, you have the peace and the strength and the, and the, and the authority of belonging. And with that authority comes the power of God. But it's for a purpose. It's not so that we can just live for ourselves. It's not so that we can just do what feels good to us. I'll tell you right now, I like doing what feels good to me. I'll bet you the rest of you do too. I do have two hams in the smoker at home. It's true. I don't feel guilty about that. But that's not why I live. I don't live for myself. My desire, when I see why Jesus rose from the dead, why he he called me, because guess what? If you have had an encounter with the person of Jesus Christ, whether it's in a vision or a dream or through the scriptures or in a, in just in your own quiet time, like I'm not going to judge how you've connected with Jesus, but if you've connected with Jesus, he's brought you the same gifts that he brought the apostles and the disciples right here. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He didn't just show up on that day in that locked room so he could help out a select few. The Bible says that that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he desires to give each one of us all of those gifts. He desires to give us a life that is encompassed in these purposes and these these, um, blessings that he determined were for us, that he and the Father desire us to to walk in. So this morning, I'm just super excited. It's hard for me to to, to wrap things down, but we need to. Um, The worship team's going to come up. We're going to do something totally different. We're going to do something totally different. Worship team, come on back up. Um, this morning, what I want us to do is I want us to start back at that very first point. There's that first point. There's that point where he said, peace be with you. It's okay if you say I could use some more peace this morning. How many could use some more peace this morning? At least about one thing in your life. Come on. I could. There's some situations in my life that like, while I'm going, like I'm telling you guys all this stuff and it's true and, and I'm, tr- and I'm living in it at the same time, like life gets crazy. Like, remember the story I talked about them going fishing because they still didn't know what to do? That's after this, by the way. Like, they didn't just spring right from this night into doing everything, like, spot on. They're like, after this, they're like, now what do we do? Uh, I guess we'll go fishing. I don't know what to do, right? Jesus knows that about us. He knows that about you. He knows that stuff's going to happen in your life. You know, there's so many things that we face that's like, you might have thought you were going to handle it a certain way until you faced it. Like, till you face a tragic diagnosis, until you face 
losing a child, until you face a loved one turning their back on you, you like you don't know what you're really going to do. And in that moment, the coolest thing is he's still offering you peace. He doesn't say, I gave you a whole bunch of peace last week. Use the, use the leftovers. Like he says, I give you peace. So this morning, um, they were really fast about getting up here. Um, this morning, we're going to take a moment. We're just going to pray. And we're going to commit ourselves to receiving his peace. Like we're going to commit to receiving his peace. And I'm going to challenge you, whether you've been walking with the Lord and you and Jesus were like talking this morning, like you and Jesus might have had just this great, like you might already have something great there. I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you, like, like after we ask for this, just that peace, because he offered it twice, it must be important. Let's ask him to, to deepen our faith. Because that belief part, that belief part starts unlocking more of the others. He says that he'll, he'll give unto us, you know, according to the measure of our faith. That doesn't mean like you have to have great faith. It's about how you're applying the faith you have. And then he'll give you more. So let's pray this morning. And uh, we're going to um, just ask him to move in our lives. And then John's going to kick off. They have a song that they're going to play. And in just a moment, John's going to get up and tell us to sing. And the song is going to be the same song that the kids opened up with. Alive, Alive. And if you believe it this morning, when we sing that, I want you to sing it out. But let's pray first. Father, this morning, um, there's a lot of things that could be said, but I think they already have been. And the truth is, we just need more. God, we, we live in a very crazy time, and we all have things that we, you, we just need, your son. We need that relationship. We need these gifts that you are offering us through his life because he lives. And so this morning, we just ask for peace. God, there's people here this morning that are facing things that I've never faced. They're facing things they've never faced. God, we need your peace. God, we don't just need it for ourselves. We need it for our children and our grandchildren. God, we need it for our nation, our community. We need it for a generation that we're, that we're just so worried about. God, we need your peace. God, we can't fix these things no more than the disciples could fix what the Romans and the Jews were going to do, but you came into that room and you said, peace be with you. So this, this morning, right now, we just ask for that peace. God, you're here right now. You haven't changed. So we're asking for that peace. And God, as we're receiving that peace, God, as we're laying things down and just saying, you know what, I trust you. Because that's what it really comes down to, is it just comes down to, am I going to trust in what I can see, or am I going to receive your peace? So this morning, as we're saying, I trust you, God, I pray that you would just quicken people's hearts, oh Lord God, that there would be an awakening. God, because it, even some of us who've seen great things, God, we can become dull, and we need to be awakened. So God, I ask for an awakening in our spirits. God, I ask for you to awaken us and help us to be a people who live like you're alive, not just because we're trying to put on a show about this Jesus that we heard about that we believe is alive, but because we are meeting you and walking with you and receiving these gifts that you have for us. God, I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.